Welcome to LeapCast. I'm your host, Dr. George James. LEAP stands for leaders, entertainers, athletes, and performers. And I'm on a journey to connect with high achievers and highlight their unexamined human moments. Tune in to learn how these high achieving LEAP individuals were able to reach their greatest potential, face their most difficult challenges, and embrace the human moments that helped them along the way. If you want to get the episode highlights directly in your email, then head to theleapcasts.com right now to subscribe. Welcome everybody back to the LeapCast. I'm your host, James, as we talk to leaders, entertainers, athletes, and performers. And I'm always excited, just another opportunity to uh, bring an amazing uh, and guest to the show, uh, Marcus Allen, who is the CEO of Big Brothers Big Sisters and just an uh, amazing, uh, amazing person. Marcus, thanks for, for joining me. Dr. James, thanks for having me. It's, it's uh, exciting to be on the show. I've seen some of your past guests and I'm a little intimidated, but I'm ready. Let's do it, brother. Hey, hey let's do it. And don't know, <laughs> they'll be intimidated with you once we get in your start, story. Uh, so, you know, I love to be able to just start well, start off with the story, what we call is the leap story. And some of that is really being able to go back to your days, maybe growing up. Tell us a little bit about that, your life, wherever you want to start, but hopefully like, in those like single digits to early double digits, somewhere around there. Yeah. About um, your journey. Well, yeah, I, I appreciate it. And I love this, this idea of the leap, right? This, I, I think it really, uh, I think for, particularly for athletes, but just people who, who had some, even some modicum of success, there has had to be a leap. It's not like a lot of stuff we do in life is incremental. And then at some point you have that big leap. And then maybe you have some successive, successive big leaps in life. And so um, I, I think I've led a life of a lot of leaps. Um, uh, you know, when I think about, you know, Dr. James, I'm, I'm a country boy from Georgia. I was born, uh, I'm a, what they call a Grady baby in Atlanta, Georgia. And, you know, it came from very modest means. My mom was uh, homeless and, 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 and lived in abject poverty, uh, basically all of her life and then she had three kids and 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 three kids by three different men um who none of them stuck around and so you know that was going to have a certain amount of challenge for a young black boy like myself and my brother and my sister and then you know and to compound that um when i was born the doctors told my mom that you know i had these physical this physical challenge with my legs and needed this surgery and again my mom didn't have medical insurance and they were not going to allow uh give me the surgery without the insurance and so I never got the the procedure and the doctor told my mom if I didn't that I wouldn't play sports and I wouldn't uh probably have some challenges with the way I walk the rest of my life right wow. and so and my mom tells the story to this day she said the first as soon as my son was born a white man was telling him what he wasn't going to be able to do <laughs> <laughs> you know, here he go. <laughs> right, right. He's the CEO now. You know? <laughs> oh, oh yeah. Mom definitely loved that story. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. She's like, I need to see this doctor right now. <laughs> but yeah, and, and 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 then we were. She was trying to raise us in uh, take more projects, which is one of the, the toughest projects in the South. Um, and, and, and going through all of those, those challenges with violence and, and poverty and drugs and all of that stuff. Um, it was just evident to my mom and others that we just weren't going to make it on the streets. And so my mom took me and my brother at the time to live with our grandmother in Thompson, Georgia, a little small town of about 6,000 people, a real rural. She lived in, um, um, back in, in slavery, uh, right after slavery, you had, share uh, croppers, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the share croppers, they lived in houses that were owned by former slave owners. Yeah. So my grandmother still lived wow. in one of the houses wow. that share croppers lived in. And she still was cleaning the house of the family of a former slave owner, wow. right? And so we're, <laughs> so we go from Atlanta, from the projects to this rural area and this woman who couldn't have been nicer um and just uh totally had you know when when i think of faith in god like she embodied what mm -hmm. it meant to love jesus christ what it meant to love god 
And so my brother and I, and then later on my sister, we grew up in that environment until my mom got her act together and left Atlanta, came to Thompson, and we made a life there. And and oh wait, and, so you were with your grandmother in this house with your siblings without your mom? Without my mom initially, yes. Yeah, wow. Without mom and no dad, right? Yeah. Um, and 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 my mom, uh, my grandmother, cleaning oh. houses for you know former slave owner family. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm curious was do you know if that if the lineage goes back for you like the slave owners that maybe owned slaves that were connected to your family no I'm not sure on that um uh, yeah I, I'm I'm not sure it wouldn't surprise me but um well one one piece that I left out was this woman that I called my grandmother mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, you, you've heard this, so you know how it was back in the day. Yeah. Um, so I found out, I don't know if I found out later on in my teenage years or if I was an adult, that she wasn't my biological grandmother. Wow. She was a woman that my grandfather eventually married, but was dating at the time. And he had another woman who was in Atlanta who had, he had my, my, my mom and her brother who are twins fraternal twins and she was an alcoholic my my biological grandmother mm. and so then he took the kids think about this you couldn't get away with this today he took my mom and my uncle and brought them to this woman that I call my grandmother and said hey raise Hello. these kids right the <laughs> yes. other woman right yes. right I said raise these kids and then he left and kept you know wrote being the rolling stone he was yeah. right I get all I can almost imagine the conversation I need you to raise these kids because they mom, mom like he is with the two families. Right. You know? And I'm just like, like you couldn't get away with that today as no. a man, right? No. Um, no, would you want to, but <laughs> at least you and I probably wouldn't do that. Right. But there's some people who would. There might be some people out there yeah, trying. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so 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 she raises my mother oh. and my my uncle as if they were her own kids. Wow. So by the time we come on the scene, I'm thinking this is my grandmother. But then now that I'm thinking about it, my mom would take us back to Atlanta as we got older. And she said, well, this is your grandma LC. And this is, you know, and, and I'm not putting all of it together. because yeah, no. Everybody's your family. Right. Your everybody's an uncle or auntie. Everybody's oh, somebody. Grandma, right, right. So you're not putting all that together. So anyway, like, so my, my, my earlier life was wrought with uh, challenges, but it also had a foundation uh, the things that really that I remember in terms of the foundation that was set for me as a child was definitely faith. Mm. It was, and my grandfather, even though he was a Rolling Stone and doing his thing, he always stayed in the picture, okay. right? And he always would spend time with us. And so he brought on this work, this work ethic as like, boy, if you're going to be anything where you got to be willing to work for it. And mm -hmm. he was a tough man and like, he just didn't take no stuff. Um, so we had the work ethic. We had the faith, and then it, there was also this idea of family, okay. right? It was, and I know it don't sound like family the way I've, I've described things, but family sure. was uh, more like less today when people talk about family, they're talking about blood relation. Back then when you talked about family, you talked about who was loyal and committed to your struggle, right? And it's a community, a right? Team. It's a community, right? right? A village. Yeah. And so that like really influenced who I am as a person today, yeah. right? Uh, and then I, I think I will underlay that with, reinforce that with this idea of struggle, this pers perseverance in the struggle. Like wow. no matter what you always, it's almost like when you watch Good Times growing up, he's like, why can't they ever get ahead? Like as soon as something <laughs> happens, then we get a good job, then James dies, you know what I'm saying? Like, right, <laughs> why? <laughs> right, why? Um, but yeah, and it was it was it was similar in our family. Like it was always a struggle, no matter what. We take one mm -hmm. step forward, we always took three steps backwards, right? Um, and so that kind of um changed me or made me who I am. But then what was interesting is, and I don't know where this comes from, this just relentless optimism. Wow. Like seriously, like I and sometimes I can't even control it. It's like and, and people say, well, you, you're just such an optimist. And they say it in a negative way. And so then you find yourself, particularly young in your leadership, mm -hmm. people say that. And you say, I'm going to stop being so optimistic. 
and you can't help it. Like as soon as someone says that, oh, we're gonna get through that. Like, that's nothing. We're gonna, you know. <laughs> Hey, don't worry about it. We got this. We got this, right? Wow. And so that's what kind of created the 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 person you see before you. And then I got to high school, grew seven inches from uh, ninth grade to twelfth grade. Um, if I back up one second, when I was twelve, I met my first mentor, at least the one that I can remember, who was a police officer, which kind of correlates to me being at Big Brothers Big Sisters because he was the first mentor man that told me that I should play sports. He was the first person who told me, he, he, had, he sat me down and had a conversation. He said, Marcus, this is after uh, 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 I, I didn't start and I wasn't playing. He said, Marcus, you don't have to be the fastest. You don't have to be the most talented. You don't have to be the strongest. He said, you just got to outwork people. That's Anybody right. we put in front of you, you outwork them. That's your goal. That's your job. And that stuck with me. Dr. James, particularly, you know, when my mom tells a story about the doctor saying that I would never play sports. And so then you fast forward. And I'm, and I'm believing all the stuff that my mentor has planted this seed in my head and my heart. And you fast forward, now I'm 6'7", um, probably 200 pounds soaking wet, but I'm 6'7", mm. about this big. Mm. Um, and I'm trying to play basketball. And um, I end up being the best player on, on our team my senior year. We go to the regionals uh, uh, finals. Um, I get recruited by the small black college, Payne College. The coach comes and sees me play. And I go there and I end up playing there for three years um, because I didn't play four years. I went to, I didn't know I was going to get a scholarship my senior year. So I joined the Army National Guard. So I had to do boot camp. So that mm -hmm. pushed me back a year. Um, and then I go to college and I'm on the GI Bill and I also have a full scholarship. Um, so I'm doing that and then I, uh, and continuing this, this work ethic, like I can do it. I'm going to push myself. And then Bernie Biggerstaff from the uh, general manager of the Denver Nuggets uh, finds out about me and I'm the Div Georgia division two player of the year. And I'm getting all these accolades and we win um, the, the SIAC championship. We become 17th ranked 17th in the nation. And he was like, who is this team? It's like one of the, it's a small black college. It's a mm -hmm. black college. And then it's one of the smallest black colleges. Right. Right. It was right. Like right. You can't. Right. It's like, <laughs> look, they they have a lot of things. They got pride. They got talent. They might not have all the resources. And then you say a smaller one, a smaller one. Right. So so that goes back to what I just said. Like, it's always in the struggle. Right. 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 My entire life, even in college, is like, OK, that's going to be a struggle. Right. Um, and so he finds out about me, invites me to Denver Nuggets. Um, I do OK there, get injured. They released me and um, I ended up, uh, my agent ended up uh, getting me a couple gigs overseas. I ended up playing professional basketball for about seven years overseas, two years in, in Sweden, two years in Finland, um, year in Israel, Argentina. Um, and, and, and for me, that was one of the greatest accomplishments in my life because it's, the way I started and what people thought of me and then to be able to do that and be one of yeah. the few people to ever get pay, paid to play basketball. Um, that, that kind of solidified this idea of being positive and that I can do anything. I love it. I, and I, cause like all along you're saying this, and I'm like, wait, how like you, you were born and the doctor said that you would not be able to play sports. Right. Okay. And yep. which is why your mama's like, I <laughs> wish he would sit, come to my face right now. Right? <laughs> but the thought of like, that says there were some, some odds, some things that you had to go through or something about your physical structure that you wouldn't have been able to play league, pick up Pee Wee, AAU, Bert, got to the place of playing professional basketball around the world. and that was not your how you started off so how did that that is my first thing like i i the working part i get to which i get at work pulled was there a physical thing that you had to overcome or was it just like like i'm just yeah um sorry about that my dog's in the back there. yeah it's all good um uh bro harry stop um the, the physical thing was, it was painful, right? So I've, I've had pain in my knees since I was, or as early as I can remember, probably 10 or 11. 
So I would play sports and have this, this pain all the time. Wow. And it was a reminder for me. And, and so with, where other kids, you know, could play and, and just go out there, like I, I, I was just having major challenges. And then, you know, I had big feet, right? Um, my feet were so big. One of my mom's boyfriends used to call me, my nickname was Foots, right? <laughs> Not feet, but Foots, <laughs> right? Right, right. And so, and- Hey, and I had my old story. I had a, I had a, a family friend that was like, would look at my sneakers and say like, oh, the, you got the ships on today. <laughs> so I, I hear you. Listen, when I, when I was 11, I wore 11. When I was 12, I wore 12, right? Today I wear 17. Oh, okay. And so, right. you got me. And, so and, and my toes are jacked up because I, 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 you know, I didn't want to be picked at. So I would try to wear, I would wear shoes that were a little bit too small for me. Yeah. So yeah. I was that kid would be walking to school and I'm kicking the back of my heel on the sidewalk because my toes hurt. <laughs> <laughs> but uh but yeah so it was just like physically I had this challenge that I knew of and then I was I was bow-legged um which I think also added to some of the misalignment uh in in my legs and so um I just I just said I was going to do it anyway right just something in my mind yeah. that I made up in my I, and, and this is a true story I remember um thinking I used to love watching Michael Jordan. Like Michael Jordan and Dominique Wilkins were my two favorite players. Okay. And you couldn't tell me at the time that Dominique Wilkins wasn't better than Jordan. Now as an adult, I know the difference. But back then, well, hey, in look. Georgia, you know, Dominique right. was the guy, right? Yeah. Dominique was, especially in Atlanta. What? Oh, no, especially, what? right? And so, and, and I was short. I was this little short, scrawny, uncoordinated kid that always got picked last on the basketball court. So I wasn't good at by no stretch of the imagination, right? I wasn't even like average. I, I, I don't even see myself as average at that time. And I remember um, going to bed every night saying, if I, if, if, if I think hard enough about growing and being tall, I'll be tall. Wow. So I had made up in my mind that I was going to wheel myself. Seriously, wow. I am not making this up. Yeah, I, yeah. I swear to God. Now, I, I think I got lucky because I probably was going to be tall anyway. But in my head, yeah, I was making myself tall because my mom is five, seven and a half. My biological father was like maybe six feet, maybe shorter. Right. My grandfather was six feet. There was nobody in my immediate family that was tall, taller than six foot, other than I knew some uncles that got to like six, two, six, three. Wow. Right. Um, or cousins, distant cousins. Uh, and so, but in my head, I told myself, and I would have these conversations with God every night, like, I'm going to be tall. Hmm. Like, I'm going to be tall, right? And as it started to happen, um, the work ethic that I had already started at 11, 12 years old, and I was in the gym lifting weights from the age of 12. I mean, I was lifting hard. Like, people thought, like, what is wrong with this guy? Like, he is horrible. He's every day. He's still horrible. You know? But he will. But, but he will that work. work. Yeah, he puts in that work. Like to this day, my high school. When I go back and they honored me a couple of years ago, it was like Marcus was the hardest working person that we've ever seen, right? And to me, that's the biggest compliment that they can yeah. give me. Yeah. Not because of my skill, not because of my talent. Um, and so I think to answer your question, it was really about like. I had this goal in my head, in my mind, and I had already detailed how hard and the pain that I was gonna have to go through. And I accepted that. I accepted that. I mean, so much you're saying is just so, so amazing, right? Like this thought of like, I know I will experience pain and I'm not gonna let that stop me. I mean, just right there, that will take many of us out, right? <laughs> we know we're going to get paid. I'm not. I'm, I'm, right? I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> right, right. You like, I accepted that there will be pain. There will be adversity. There will be challenge. And I believe, right, I, I have this belief, this optimism that it will work out. And I'm going to put in the work on top of that. I mean, that, that keys to success, keys to life, because I know that's what you you over and over to where you are but you had to learn that at such an early age and i'm so glad that you did 
because like I said, so many of us would say like, no, I'm not, it's, that's too much. I'm not trying to do that. I'm not trying to go there. And the fact that you're like painful, but I'm one. And I can see how like believe, like right now, like there's a lot of uh, emphasis around manifestation, around energy, around how people think about things, right? So, right. so they are faith, right? This thought of like, leave, well, where's your energy? And you're like, I'm going to be taller, right? I'm going to be taller. And you just, and, and when it started to happen, I could imagine that probably said, see, I, I knew it. Like I knew I was going to be taller. And if I could, if I could be taller, what can I believe? Right. Yeah. And, 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 as a as a as a young adult, a young person and a young adult, to your point, I only looked at it from a standpoint of being positive and optimism. Um, but as I, you know, I turned fifty last year, and over the last probably ten years, I've grown to understand that it wasn't really optimism for optimism's sake. Yeah. Um, my optimism was grounded in faith. And I just didn't put the two together, right? I, I, you know, being raised in a Baptist household, um, or AME actually, African Methodist Episcopal, um, and being raised in the, under the principle of Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and and saying that you know uh, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me, like that's really where the optimism came from but I didn't put them together, right? And so, and, 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 and then the principle of, you know, going through pain, you think about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, you know, like going through struggle, like those things, even though I wasn't articulating them, yeah. they were embodied in me in a way that I didn't need to articulate them because I was living them. Yeah, it was right? life. Right, so I was just living, I was living my faith, but I was, talking secular language around it, right? Yeah. Because I didn't want to offend people, mm -hmm. right? I didn't want to like turn people off because my whole thing has always been, I want to live a life where um, I want to inspire people with my words. I want to motivate them with my actions, right? And so I'm, I'm living through that and not understanding what's really feeding me though, right? Because I'm yeah. so focused on everybody else. And I'm sure you see this as a psychologist all the time. I'm so... Yeah. Like I'm looking out this window all the time and I'm not balancing it by saying, okay, well, let me go look in the mirror too, right? I'm running, am I running my race or am I running everybody else's race? That's right, right. yeah. And so um, I had to come to some kind of balance with that as an adult, but sports, basketball allowed me to, to hone a lot of that mm -hmm. energy that I had around, you know, what is, who is Marcus Allen? Yeah. Right. And this 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 idea of and I was talking about it this week uh, about self-awareness. And when we talk about mentorship and I talk about my mentor, my first mentor, and then I talk about being a CEO of Big Brothers and Sisters and mentoring and, and, and our whole program modality is built around mentoring. Ultimately, what is mentoring about and what did mentoring do for me and what I what I gather from the mentors who poured into me and the ones I actually listened to. Uh, <laughs> That's the key right there. <laughs> right? <laughs> who we listened to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was, they, the main thing they did for me is help, help me to reveal myself to me. Yeah. Right? Like, that first mentor, when he said, I don't have to be the fastest, strongest, most talented, and I can outwork people, like it was already in me, mm -hmm. right? But he helped me to, his words, his action, his time that he spent with me, it helped to bring it out. Yeah. Right. What I, lo what I love about that is it also said, you know, some of us <clears throat> know we're the most talented, right? And that's what we ride, or we're the strongest or tallest. He might have known, like, hey, look, you ain't that tall. Maybe you ain't that strong right now. But your thing, I already know it, is if you work. And you're like, that's it. That was my key. Like somebody else saw this, the thing, the key, and you heard it. You yep. listened. And it, it, it was meaningful. Yep. So that, that, that's been driving me. Wow. Wow. So you've had this job. I hear <laughs> professional basketball on the world. Uh, so what, what happened? Like what, 
obviously you learned so many life lessons from family, from community, from faith, from hard work, from optimism, all, all right. And, and you've seen the results, right? From a small college that now we're able to be successful, being looked at to professional basketball, all that stuff. What did you do after that? Like, what were your moves there? Because I'm wondering, what was the filled in the gap before you got to Big Brother, Big Sister? Yeah, when 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 my basketball, one of the things that when I went to college, um, I, I didn't go, I didn't get paid. The money I got paid to go to college wasn't through my athletic scholarship. I got an academic scholarship from General Motors. And my coach just lucked out and was just like, well, I don't have to spend money on him. I'll bring him in. I could put this money towards one of my other players, right? You don't have many resources. So, hey, right? you, you got it, right? And so I, when I was in college, I always, and in high school, I always pride myself on being one of the smartest people in the classroom. And when I say smart, I don't mean like, I, I maybe not smartest, but that I was going to make the, the uh, be at the top of the list in terms of making grades, making A's, right? And, and so, that worked out for me, that hard work ethic. I got all A's in high school, got an academic scholarship. Uh, I was on a dual scholarship with General Motors to go to Payne for three years. And I was supposed to go to Tuskegee for two years and get a, a dual degree in uh, 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 computer science pre-engineering. And so for me, that was my pathway to get out of the hood, to get out of poverty. Basketball playing professionally was never a part of the deal. <laughs> never part of the deal. Like, of course, I dreamed about it like every other basketball player did, but I was just like, there's no way. Um, <clears throat> and so when the opportunity came and I did it and traveled the world and um, I started experiencing all these injuries, like I've had three knee surgeries, a broken foot, broken nose, concussion. Mm -hmm. um, you see this finger is crooked. I've, I've had a bone pop out of this finger. I, 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 I've just had a lot of injuries. Mm -hmm. And so I'm 28 years old and 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 I'm having this conversation. Wait, all of that was before? All of that was at 28? By, by 28, 28, by 20, like, listen, professional sports, you're lucky if you play professional, if you get three years on average, the average player is going to play three years, right? So I played six years. So I was just, and, and the entire time I'm playing, I'm thinking, man, I'm falling behind. Mm -hmm. Like I'm 26, 27, 28. When I finished playing sports, and by the way, I didn't finish my degree. Like I left school early to play pro ball. Okay. So I'm thinking when basketball is over, I got to go back and start where 22 year olds are starting. Mm -hmm. Right. Matter of fact, I'm further back than that because I don't have my degree. Yeah. So um, I'm down in Argentina and I have this knee injury. And Argentinians, they, they're serious about basketball. You have one, you go down there and you break a fingernail. They're like, okay, he's out. Let's bring in another. They have another they're serious about here. all sports. In 15 minutes, it's a meat market, right? And I mean, they had, and they bring in guys like you sitting there and the guy bigger than you. Uh, he played at a, a much bigger college than you played at. And, yeah. and he's he just as hungry as you are. Right. He's ready. Right? He read it. He read it. And you hurt. Yeah. But they were just like, no, we want to keep Marcus. And we're gonna bring in. They brought this guy Billy Allen, who was playing at uh, at Memphis with uh, Penny Hardaway. He was a uh, oh. big guy. And I see this dude. I'm just like, man. And 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 then they bring this other guy, Billy Smith, who who later played in the NBA. And I'm seeing all this happen. And and Dr. James, I just say, you know what? This is a sign. Like it's time for me to give this up. And at 28, I felt old. Oh. Right. At 28, I felt old. Uh, Cause these guys, they were younger than me. Yeah. Right? Billy yeah. Smith, twenty four when he yeah. came in. I'm twenty eight, um, and so I I decided then and there that I was going to give it up. And I came to Philadelphia, and uh, it took me years to figure this out. But my first probably year or two in Philly, I was depressed, mm. and I didn't I didn't have a word for it at the time. But it was this idea of, you know, I've been really serious about basketball for like sixteen years. And now it's taken away, and it, and it and I didn't go out the way I wanted to go out. Of course, right? And I and I didn't make all the money that I thought I could have made, so I felt like I left money on the table. Mm -hmm. uh, and now I got to get a job. And now and you feel like you're behind. Yeah, I feel, I, and I feel like I'm behind. And the only person I knew in Philadelphia at the time was the, the the young lady I was dating, and we broke up probably three months after me moving to Philadelphia. Wow. So I'm dealing with that. 
And and I'm you know just totally transparent. And I'm also dealing with the fact that by that time I have two kids, right? And um, and they hungry. And they hungry. <laughs> and and their moms are just like, hey, uh, you know, you need to spend more time. You need to send more money. You need to do all of this stuff, right? So, and I'm thinking about my future. Yeah. And so, um, it was it, it was rough uh, in the first two years. And and what. I, I settled on was what am I good at, and and I was at going to Temple University, getting my degree in psychology. And the only reason I was getting a degree in psychology was because I'm thinking maybe I'll go get a law degree, right? And so I'm getting my degree in psychology, um, and I started working for this company, Vision Quest, that was working with kids um, mm -hmm. across the country. And and I went there to volunteer initially, and and the guy who was running the Philadelphia office was like, no, we we can't have you volunteer. Somebody like you, you should be working here. And people could could recognize pretty quickly that I wasn't from Philadelphia, uh, not just my accent at the time, but just they just could tell just the way I I moved, right? It's like that. Your you, relentless you're optimism. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not from Philly with that optimism, right? <laughs> and and so that. In, in some ways made people gravitate towards me, right? People were telling me at the time, well, if you're not from Philly, like it's gonna be hard and blah, 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 blah. But my experience was totally different. Philadelphia, for the most part, embraced me. And particularly black men, mm. like black men in Philadelphia, like they were just attracted to me. And and I ate that up, right? right. It was just like, and so, and, and I mean, from all areas of life, particularly guys in the hood because mm -hmm. I grew up in the hood. Right. And so, yeah. and I would go to 25th and diamond and I was go to these places to play ball in the hood and all that stuff. And they loved me. Like I went to, we would play in uh, the Hank Gathers league at 25th and diamond. And it was, you walk in the gym, it's packed at nine o'clock in the morning and you got, you know, people work for the DEA, FBI, being over here, you got drug dealers, people <laughs> who committed homicides and all. So all of us in one neutral place, territory. Yeah, neutral territory, right? Playing ball, they're yeah. getting on the yeah. game, right? <laughs> like all kinds of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Right. And that's where I started to build my core in Philadelphia. Okay. And from there, I, I became the chief operating officer at Vision Quest within five years. Um, and then decided that, you know, Vision Quest was a for-profit company and I decided I didn't want to do for-profit work anymore and wanted to do something that I felt could have more impact. And then I went to Achievability and ran that for four years. And then I came over to Big Brothers, Big Sisters. Wow. I mean, I love it. And I, I want to really highlight something you said in experience that happens for so many athletes. Like you say, like, you know, you're 28 and you're right. Like folks five that they're at the peak. If you're somehow in your 30s playing some professional sport and that is a very small number for almost regardless of the sport unless it's like golf right, right. like right. other than that right for the most part uh, even even tennis can is a younger sport and so the thought of kind of saying like i'm going to finish and that after retirement depression is real right this thought of like my identity, uh, what am i doing uh, wh what was my purpose can be there if you're especially if you're not one of those folks that like you got a broadcasting career or you got you know co right after like and so i'm glad that you were able to share and the pressures that you felt at that time i also love how like that didn't stop you right like that you were still your relentless optimism your work ethic and the ability to like to connect and gravitate to people and people gravitating to you really just continue to fuel you and energize you, which I think is just just awesome. It talks a lot about you, you and how you can just show up. So I appreciate that you shared both the depression part, which is so real, and how you just kept pushing forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that. Um, it's, I, I, I just give so much credit to my upbringing, you know, and, and just the background I had that I had no control of. I guess the only control I had was how I responded to it, right? Because yeah. I have a lot of friends and family who grew up in the same situations, but right. life didn't work out so well for them, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's always this 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 thing you think about, like, well, why me? 
Like, yeah. how did I respond and get this and others didn't, right? I had my best friend who, uh, um, when we were growing up from probably, probably sixth grade all the way through high school, he was much more talented in, in basketball and football, had a, a gift of gab, uh, he got all the girls, all kinds of stuff. Um, and then I look at where he ended up and it's just like, wow, like, like it, it's just this idea of just being thankful and, and, and grateful for that work ethic that I believe created opportunity, right? Because the work ethic prepares you. And so when opportunity shows up, some people can't take advantage of the opportunity. Yeah. But those who put the work in, burn the midnight oil, sacrifice, mm -hmm. has some discipline, opportunity shows up. And, and, and the thing is, I, I, I think opportunity shows up throughout your life. Yeah. Right. For like, I don't think for the most part, anyone doesn't get a chance to take advantage of opportunity. And some opportunities are bigger than others. And mm -hmm. some, for some people, opportunity happens more frequently. But for all of us, opportunity for the most part happens. And for those of us who don't pay attention and aren't doing the things we need to do, being disciplined, being focused, uh, sacrificing, doing all of those things, no matter how many times opportunity shows up, you can't take advantage of it. You can't take advantage of it. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I, I love that. There's so many times I've, I've heard or talked about, you know, opportunity really favors those who are prepared, right? Like, so, so when, when it comes, if you're not ready or willing to do the work, now either you miss that opportunity or don't capitalize on it. And it, it sounds like you were able and willing. And at the same time, you know, I don't know if you've gone through this. I've experienced this in my own life. Same thing. I can look at friends and family, people who look like they were had really early great successes. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, riding the bus, going to class, trying to figure out things. I'm like, I can't even afford a car. My boy is having like the latest car, you know, the stuff like that, that you could compare yourself but it's the consistency work ethic that then starts to make a difference because you can look around and some people experience the survivor's remorse, right. Or, or guilt, right. This thought of like, somehow I, I made it right. hard work, sacrifice, discipline, and somehow they didn't. And that's hard uh, to, to look at that. And I can imagine, you know, especially with what you said about that first mentor who <laughs> saw you and kind of shared this with you, how that might have influenced where you are now. So, uh, so if you don't mind, kind of share what you've been doing now, or for the past, you know, number of years, and why you feel like it brought this organization to one of the top in the country. Right? You have done phenomenal work, and I, I'm just wondering how has all of that transpired. I think you know a lot of it has transpired through what we just talked about just now. It's um a lot of failing, right? Just, you know, oftentimes people, when they, they see people like me who who's positive, who's optimistic, they think there's things just happen for you, right? <laughs> they they, yeah. they just see your highlight reel, right? Like they're listening to this podcast, right? And they right. just, they probably like, oh, he played pro sports. Uh, he's tall. He's, you know, right. you know, yeah. that it just happened. For, and they, and, and, and you you really get the chance to really sit down and really talk people through like yeah. here's how this opportunity came and here's what I did to prepare for this opportunity yeah. and then what happens is and I, and I experienced this even today in my leadership at Big Brothers Big Sisters um, now you have all of this right you have this body of work right and 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 you're trying to translate this body of work to a group of folks who are hungry and want success in their own lives. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to give them the message, but the only thing they can see is your title. <laughs> you're yeah. the CEO. Of course you're going to say that. You're, yeah. you know, you're Marcus <laughs> Allen and you're the, and they yeah. don't understand like, do you know how much work that I put in to build a brand of Marcus Allen? Do you know that I only knew one person in Philadelphia when I yeah. moved here in 2019, mm. right? Do you know that I didn't have a job, that I didn't have a degree, that I didn't have social capital, that I'm a black man from down south with a thick accent, southern and accent. 
black college. Right. You know, the, small, the smallest black college, right? Right. Right. In Philadelphia. Working in North Philadelphia. Yeah. Right. Um, and so I, I'm I'm really, you know, in, in this phase of my life and my leadership, I'm really searching my heart for the words and the examples to give folks to help mm -hmm. them feel like they can achieve whatever that milestone is that they're trying to get to. Yeah. And think about different examples in my life that can resonate with them because I think people listen to people who they feel you've been through something similar that I've been through. Uh, and so sometimes uh, I share my struggles or I share my failures um, with people so that they understand that not that I like, look at this person, he made it through and if he can do it, anybody can do it, but more to say, um, here's a person who's willing to be vulnerable and tell you the, and be transparent. Yes. Right. Because oftentimes what we see at big brothers, big sisters and in my work, um, our kids don't have access to the right information mm -hmm. and the right people to have the right conversations with them to help them envision themselves getting to where you are, yeah. right? We, we give them the, the, micro, the microwave version of your story. We give them the microwave version of your success and, and not really think through, well, what do you need to hear it and how do you need to hear it, right? Um, and so oftentimes people say, Man, every time you tell your story, I learn something new. Or every time you tell it, like you say it in a different way is because I'm talking to different people. Yeah. Right. So I don't have to change the facts, but I yeah. do have to change sometimes the tone of what I emphasize. And so in my leadership at Big Brothers Big Sisters, when I got there in 2013, uh, this is an organization that um, Big Brothers Big Sisters, like historically, has been a white ran organization. Right. It's what I would call when I was coming there a corporate nonprofit. Right. Mm -hmm. I had, you know, all the C-suite, you know, uh, white men on the board. It was always ran, the CEO, executive director was always white. I'm the first black to run the organization in its 106 year history. Wow. Um, and 80% of the workers were white. Yet 75%, uh, I'm sorry, more than that, almost 80% of the people being served were black and brown. Yeah. For which this was not uncommon for most nonprofits in Philadelphia if they mm -hmm. were, you know, at least $2 million or more, right? It, it was always ran by white people. That was what they did. And we were kind of shut out of that, those opportunities. And so when I came to the organization, which had a phenomenal board at the time and still does, and that board had, was really serious. And, and on that board was Wilson Good Sr., mm. who became one of my uh, uh, best mentors. Um, they were really serious about diversity, equity, and inclusion in 2013. And so when they hired me and I'm at my first board meeting and one of the white, God bless his soul, uh, one of the white board members said, now we're diverse. We got a black leader and blah, 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 blah. And I said, listen, sir, I said, not to be disrespectful. Now, this is my first board meeting. <laughs> From the door. <laughs> yeah. <All right. laughs> Let me show you how black folks act. Oh, no, uh, I said, uh, you, no, you 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 didn't uh, make this organization diverse. You just hired one black man, and I said you got one black man with one perspective. Yeah. And I said we have a long way to go if we want to be a diverse organ an organization that's known for its diversity, its equity, uh, and its inclusion. And so, and, and then I educated the board. I said, listen, just I know you guys have heard a lot about DEI. This is in 2013, before. I know. I was going to say, but this was before it was popular. Yeah, this was before it was popular, right? And I went and I said to the board, I said, listen, for me, the D and DEI stands for what it looks like. I said, the I, inclusion, stands for how it feels. I said, but one of the most important pieces of this is going to be our E. And that is how we act. What do we do? Like, what do we do to change what's happening, particularly to Black folks? And I said, I'm going to focus on Black folks because most of the clients we serve are Black. We live in a city that's majority Black. Mm -hmm. I said, so I, I just want to be clear that this is where the direction we want to go in because I know something about this. Yeah. 
I don't know about that, but I know something about this. Mm -hmm. And they bought it hook, line, and sinker. And so it started locally. And then I started to take that message to the national big brothers and sisters. And now I'm at the conference and we're at the first conference in Denver and we're in this group and it's all uh, CEOs of the large, uh, of the cities around the country. And there's about 40 something of us. And I look around the room, I was one of two black men hmm. that were CEOs of Metro supported Big Brothers Big Sisters, right? Hmm. Urban areas. And that guy, he was half white, half black, married to a white woman. You know what I'm saying? So, so you know, I, you know, it, 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 and out, and he was light skinned I'm dark skin, and I stand yeah. out. Yeah, I stand six, up. Se six, seven. six, seven, right? Black. I mean, black, black, right? <laughs> you see me, right? And, and and I say in that meeting, I said, listen, I, I, I really love that everyone has embraced me in this 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 national organization. I said, but we have a problem. I said, and nothing against any of you, but we serve across the country, mostly black kids, but ain't hard no, we only got like two black men and about eight black women. Mm -hmm. And it's 50 of us, almost 50 of us. Yeah. I said, you can't tell me that that makes everybody, everybody's fine with that. And that's when I, and I was like, I'm about to cause, I'm about to have some enemies. And believe it or not, Dr. James, I, I, may, I may have created some enemies, but they were invisible to me. People gravitated to me. Nice. And then I realized I had a gift mm -hmm. and my gift was I could say the toughest things that most people can't even begin to talk about. And I could say it and I can say it to the people that normally would get upset and they would love me for it. So then it got to the point I'm being invited across the country mm. way before 2020 rooms full of white folks talking about racism white fragility, white supremacy, and, I, and I'm talking to corporate folks. Mm. Then they started paying me for it. Nice. So now I got an agency that 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 um, works for me, uh, ran by this Jewish woman, Jewish white woman, who sends me all across the country and they're paying me for this medicine. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, and so, and it's, it is all coming from the heart. And so now I'm running an organization that believes in the values or at least espouses the values that I'm talking about. Our board now is more diverse. Um, we, our, our staff are more diverse. We're getting more embedded in the community and our revenue is increasing. So our revenue has increased like 75% since I got there. And so for me, that shit that says that you can like, mm -hmm. like diversity can be a business proposition. Yes. Right? Like the, the collective genius of us all is when we have different people, different perspectives at the table. And we, we are showing that it works. And I'm hoping that when I leave Big Brothers Big Sisters that they don't veer away from that, right? Like, that, that, like this, like I haven't been perfect and there's some things that as a leader I got to get better at and then there's some things that I still want us to accomplish. But I'm serious about this idea of representation. Yeah. Right. That we have to speak for us. We have to do for us, but we need to partner with others that don't look like us to do it. Yeah. But yeah. we have to lead have to it. access. Yeah. yeah. We have to lead it. I love how you talked about sometimes in lots of ways we're in a position and people see it, but they don't see the journey. You know, like people will see that I have my doctorate. Yes. But you don't know that, like, if it wasn't for my academic scholarship, <laughs> For undergrad, I don't know if I would have gotten the my parents would have been able to do it, or all these things along the way that that say the full story. And I love how you've shared more of your story that you didn't just show up. And then even when you were in the position of leader of CEO, that's not easy at all. Right. And that you are willing to say some things in some is that some people have gotten run, ran out of town for saying less and yeah. that and, and that you know it's interesting for me just hearing you say that you rec recognize that you had this gift right and that so many of us even in our professional careers even with our titles don't even recognize our gifts our ability our sweet spot and to be able to say oh okay 
I can say these difficult things and I find the right ways to do it and, and because I know who I am, they accept it and they, they come towards me. That's gold, right? Being able to do that. And I, I love that you've been able to do that over the years and the impact that you've made and, and how it's also helped the bottom line, right? And so there's all these different ways. There's a couple of things I like to ask people before we end, probably three things you've, you've probably had me to work with, collab with lots of different people along the way uh, with, with what you're doing now, or even what you're aspired to do, who would you want to collab with? Wow. That's a good one. Um, um, Jeffrey Canada uh, in New York, when yeah. he, he started, um, you know, his organization brick by brick. And I had a brief conversation with him years ago and, and I did the same thing to him that I say people do to me. Cause when I saw it, I was like, man, I want to do what you did when I was a chief, but I want to change West Philadelphia and Philadelphia the way you did in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and um, it's a Harlem zone, right? Is yep, that the Harlem zone. Yep. yep. And, and, and at that time, I remember President Obama came and they tried to replicate it and had a whole grant process to have that replicate in other cities. And he said, Marcus, you know, I started that like 30 years ago. <laughs> started now right 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 and, and i'll I'm see you in 20 it. years yeah i was just reading about it but it, right. you know it, 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 and so that that really cemented some stuff for me because you know we we're in this microwave society we think we see a problem we got to solve yeah. it today yeah. and it takes time and so he's somebody um that i love to spend more time with that's awesome yeah i love that uh and and, and for you in particular I, i'm going to add this question um how many mentors have you had that that really stand out for you? Um, so let me define mentor. Yes. Um, in, in, in the context of this question, um, when I think of mentor, I think of someone that I actually know and they know me and there's an intentional relationship there to help me um, to improve something, right? Yeah. Um, and in that context, I would say probably about 10, about 10. Um, and they are, they range in gender, race, industry that they work in, socioeconomic status. Um, but what they all have in common is from what I can see is they have a genuine interest in me winning. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And out of those 10, and I love how you defined it and, and that you can, you know, are clear and intentional. How many of those 10 did you pursue and how many pursued you? Um, I know at least two that pursued me. Um, and I don't think I pursued any of the other eight. Um, I think it was either opportunistic or, you know, there was some kind of thing that brought us together and I saw something in them and, and just, just started revealing myself to them and it just happened, right? I, I don't know that I've ever gone up to someone or saw a person and say, you know, I want to make that person my mentor, right? right, right. Maybe with Wilson Good Senior, like, because, <laughs> you know, he has that presence and, and so, but he was a board member and he was kind of intimidating too. So I'm like, I don't know. You know, he got so much going on. Right. And honestly, he actually, I, I, it's almost like he pursued me because I, and now I'm thinking about it. I remember him and I was having one of our first conversations and he tells me his story and then tells me like how he said, Mark, you and I have so much in common. And he talks about his family being sharecroppers and where he came from down south. And then uh, he said, and I went into how he went into a housing nonprofit housing program, which I went into a nonprofit housing. So he's showing me all these parallels. And then at the end of the conversation, he says, "So Marcus, all of that to say, don't be surprised what God is going to do in your life." He said, "I became the first black mayor, and I can see something similar in you." Right? Wow. Just dropped it. And I was like, I was done. Yeah. <laughs> I, no, it, it, Dr. James, and I'm sure like knowing Dr. Good, like he doesn't like try to flatter anybody, yeah. right? That's just yeah. not who he is. Yeah. 
And so, and for him to be on my board and see how I lead and see all this stuff and things I'm good at and things I'm not so good at, for him to say that to me, I, I, I just, you know, it, 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 it was like my first mentor yeah. told me about sports and gave me the recipe, right? I felt like Wilson Good was giving me the recipe for greatness, <laughs> you know? Yeah. No, I, I love that. And the reason why I asked that last question was because, and and you, in the way that I, I, that I think a lot of the times the mentors that are, I have been impacted for me, I initiated some part of the relationship or, or I was engaging in some part of it. Not that I'm going after you to be my mentor, but when I felt that I'm like, Oh, I want more of that. Yeah. <laughs> Let me like reach out. Um, and that, you know, sometimes I think there's ways that people think that the mentors are always going to come to them and some do, but a lot of times you got to massage that relationship or work on it. Uh, last two questions. What, what does wellness mean to you? What does mental health uh, uh, wellness mean to me? Um, for me, mental wellness is peace, right? I, I, I heard Will Smith um, do this thing where he talked about um, he'd much rather have peace than happiness. He said, because sometimes happiness is chaos because it's full of emotion and, and it's fleeting, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but peace, like real peace, is this idea of I'm connected to everything and it's okay that I'm okay that you know I can I can feel my heartbeat I can feel my breath right I can like just really take in this amazing gift that God has given us and called life right and so um, what what I've learned about me is I always thought I was an extrovert because people tend to make you think a whole lot of stuff about yourself, right? They they label you because they see something. And so because when I'm out, I can be the life of the party, I can get a lot of attention and I can work the room, people automatically assume, even some of my closest friends assume that I'm an extrovert. But what I've learned about me, or I thought I learned about me last year when I did, uh, rode my bike across country was that I was a introvert because I love being in my mind. I love spending time with Marcus. I love Marcus Allen. Like he's an awesome mm -hmm. person and I love hanging out with him. That's and cool. my daughters came back to me this year. They said, no, dad, you're not an extrovert or introvert. You're an ambivert. And I had mm -hmm. never heard that yeah. term before. So my daughters, my 18 year old daughter educated yeah. me on that. And I think she's right. Yeah, no, I was actually uh, one of my mentees who I, who showed me that I'm like, oh yeah. I would always just do once, which we do, right? We keep yeah. these, you know, dichotomies and polarize, you know, like it has to be one or the other when there's a lot of overlap. So yeah. that, that, that's great that they, they share that with you. Last, uh, what mental wellness advice would you give to your younger self? And that could be as early as yesterday or any time in the past. Man, you be asking some, like, I forgot you were a psychologist. <laughs> Man, what you thought was going to happen? <laughs> All right. Um, what advice, mental wellness advice would I give to myself in the past? Um, I think I would go back to when I was a kid, um, probably in my adolescence, and just tell that Marcus that it's, it's going to be okay. Like, like things are going to work out for you. Right. That there's no need to worry about what's going to happen with your mother. There's no need to worry about like, as a young person, I was always trying to take care of everyone. Yeah. And I would tell that Marcus Allen, like, just take care of yourself right now. Like, like it's okay to be selfish to a certain extent, right? Like put some energy into you because the hard work was about other folks, to be honest with you. Like I'm looking for validation. I'm looking to achieve and get that from the external environment, right? That's really about other folks, right? To a certain extent, the being positive, the outward positiveness was about other people because I was a people pleaser and I wanted everyone around me to forget about all the bad stuff that was happening and be happy. I would tell that Marcus Allen, the most important thing is 
make sure you're good like to that idea of peace like what truly calms you and make you feel good about you you know wow yeah no that, that that's powerful i can just say in my my life and people i, I with how we some think so much about caring for other people or even folks like oh do i go off to college or do i start a, my first job how will this impact this person or that, that? but if you just so if it's going to be all right and focus on you and those other things do start to work out yeah uh, it, it makes a difference marcus uh, look thank you so much for joining me thanks for being a part of leapcat in your journey so many gems uh, from this optimism for putting in the work to uh, being able to put the difficult, hard things in spaces to make a difference and make an impact. Uh, and, and just the organization that you've been able to build uh, to a next level um, and to, to really increase DEI before popular. So thank you so much. Uh, any last words before we, we close out? Yeah, yeah. First of all, I, Dr. Jane, thank you for having me on the show. Thank you for doing this. I think this is enlightening for people. Like you, you just don't know some of the things that you say and some of your guests, what they say is impacting and changing people's lives. Um, so I, I just, you know, uh, as, as, as brothers in the fight for other people, um, I just want to say hats off to you. Um, and this, like this conversation went way faster than I thought it was going to go. Um, that, that was a quick hour. Um, I feel like it's so much for us to talk about, but, um, I just thank you for allowing me to share my story, um, and allowing me to, to get some free therapy because you guys are expensive these days and I can't afford yeah. to, <laughs> to get the therapy that I need. So I feel like this is, is therapeutic for me. So thank you brother for that. No, I appreciate that. Hey, look, it goes uh go ways because i've had even my clients say i should pay you more because when i listen to the podcast I feel i'm getting an extra <laughs> extra session. yes uh but i appreciate your vulnerability and willingness and and thanks for your kind words and uh once again thanks for joining me uh on the on the podcast thank you sir wow what an incredible ride we just went on with another great member of the leapcast community i appreciate you listening and hope you got some tangible value from the episode Please let us know what you think by leaving a comment, rating, and review. As always, please don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. This is Dr. George James, and I'll see you next time.